It seems like a lifetime ago, but over the Christmas school break in 1988, my then wife and I went to visit our parents to give them some important news. We went first to Memphis to tell my in-laws that we were adopting a little girl from Korea. Now, of course, I knew they were racist. You couldn't spend five minutes with them and not be painfully aware of that. But nothing had prepared me for the ferocity of their reaction to the news that we were going to make them grandparents to an Asian baby. I will not repeat here the racist screed that we were treated to that day. But catch me alone sometime and buy me a beer and I'll tell you the whole damn story. <laughs> it might take that. <clears throat> so then we drove to Kentucky to tell my racist parents what we were going to do. But after what we had been through in Tennessee, I knew to set the stage a little bit better. I sat my mom and dad down and I told them, we are going to give you some really good news, the best news of our lives. And I just want you to know that how you react to that news, I'm going to remember for the rest of my life. And it might determine what kind of relationship we will have in the future. After I'd given them the news, my father sucked in his breath through his teeth and wisely left the room without saying anything until he could come back in the room and not say the wrong thing. My mother teared up a little bit, but managed to ask some basic questions about when we would be getting her and what we knew about her, what mother called her real parents, I refer to as her birth parents. When they met her, they tried to put a good face on it. My mother spent a good deal of time making a needle-pointed uh, blanket for her baby bed that featured a little blonde girl with curly hair, which was mother's protest. But when my dad got me alone a few weeks later, he looked down at her sleeping in, in her crib and said, I think she's got a lot of white in her. <laughs> As he was trying to work out some way that he might accept her. Both my parents and my in-laws were southern hillbillies. To the best of my knowledge, none of them had ever known an Asian. My dad and my father-in-law had served in the military, but once the war was over, neither had ventured outside of the United States and very rarely ventured outside of Kentucky and Tennessee. Why then was my daughter's race such a painful issue to them. She's smart, she's beautiful, she's personable, she's well-educated, she's successful, she's world-traveled, she has a ton of friends. In short, she is everything that they were not. But also exactly the kind of daughter that everyone wishes they could have had. Which in the end, is probably what our families feared 31 years ago. What I am only lately beginning to realize is that the root of racism is not so much a fear and loathing of races that are perceived as being somehow different or other, but actually a fear of a loss of status, a loss of privilege, a loss of a sense of superiority that somehow comes with being born white. I've lately been reading this book, Dying of Whiteness. It's written by a guy from Kansas City, uh, Jonathan Metzel, who is now a professor of sociology and psychiatry at Vanderbilt, so he gets two good marks in his, in his uh, cred credits. Being from Missouri and now living in Tennessee, he, was, uh, he has examined the paradoxical problem of why the most ferocious white racists are almost always the people who have the least about which to feel superior. Now, I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole here, but 
why is this guy worried about racial purity? <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that there was not a lifeguard on duty at the gene pool when he was born. <laughs> but this is a part of the irony of the lingering racism in America. 150 years after the end of slavery, 50 years after the integration of public schools, neighborhoods, and workplaces, more than a decade after electing the first black president of the United States, how is race still a thing? How has it survived? In the most recent release of Star Wars movie, this Disney film, Walt Disney, proudly featured a very passionate lesbian kiss in a film that is primarily for children. This wouldn't have been done just a few years ago. I say proudly, but they did cut that scene out of the movie when it was released in other countries because, you know, at the Kingdom of the Great Rat, they are convinced that Americans are sophisticated and other people are not. So we couldn't let Europeans see this, for example. <clears throat> Honestly, you can't make this crap up. It's just, <laughs> it's, just, it's just the way American exceptionalism rolls. But why, if we're ready for this in a children's movie, do most of our neighbors here in Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Kansas, Arkansas, still flinch when they see this? Metzl writes about what, what now that I've seen it in writing, I feel like I sh it should have been obvious to us all along. It's talking about racism in this part of the country is kind of like talking to a fish about water. <laughs> For those who have little else to claim as a reason to not feel inferior to the world, being white becomes an increasingly precious possession that many white Southerners are loath to give up. Now, I say Southerners, but it should be noted that some of the worst race riots and racist holdout communities have been in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Massachusetts, and some of the current white supremacist groups that are camping out in Washington and Oregon. But, you know, we have a saying in psychology, when you hear hoofbeats, you think horses and not zebras. If you want to talk about racism, the South is the most certain place to go. Metzl didn't have to travel outside of Missouri, Kansas, or Tennessee to find uh, plenty of subjects to interview for this book. Now, a hundred years ago, the first black man to earn a doctorate at Harvard, W.E.B. Du Bois, wrote, It must be remembered that the white group of laborers, while they do receive a low wage, were compensated in part by a kind of public and psychological wage. They were given public deference and titles of, currents of courtesy because they are white. They were admitted freely with all classes of white people to public functions, public parks, and the best schools. The police were drawn from their ranks, and the courts, dependent on their votes, treated them with such leniency as to encourage lawlessness. Their vote selected public officials, and while this had small effect upon their economic situation, it had great effect upon their personal treatment and the deference shown to them. White schoolhouses were the best in the com community and conspicuously placed, and they cost anywhere from twice to 10 times as much per capita as the colored schools. The newspapers specialized on news that flattered the poor whites and almost utterly ignored the Negro, except in crime and ridicule. This was written 100 years ago. Dubois was describing the ipso facto inheritance of every white person in America. No matter how poor you were, your kids went to the same white school as everybody else. And when Metz writes about Missouri, he talks about how we have made our conceal and carry and our open carry laws regarding guns so lax 
that it's not even uncommon now to see people carrying guns into a grocery store or into a Walmart. But even still, when a white man does that, most people don't react at all. We, did, we had one at a Walmart where he was carrying an assault rifle. But most days here in Springfield, you could see someone openly carrying a pistol in a public place, and they don't react unless the person carrying the gun is black. And if they're black, someone will inevitably call the police. But the difference is, is that when Dubois made these observations, he was just describing the way that things were in America. But that is what made school integration such a violent and painful transformation during the Civil Rights Movement. White people realized that they were losing their claim to exclusivity, their claim to status. The social dividing line that made their trailer park better than the tenements where black neighbors were living is that the school bus for the white school came to their trailer park, but it did not go to the black neighborhood. All the while, poor whites have always had more in common with poor blacks than they ever had with their bosses, but they get this deception, this sense of white privilege that somehow they are better than the people who really share everything in the world in common with them. You notice this even now. I, <laughs> I consume a lot of news, and right now it's driving me crazy that every five minutes they talk about British royal royalty issues, which, you know, A, no one is a royal highness in 2020. There is no such thing as hereditary uh, royalty, and we need to stop acting like there is. But it sets British people up to believe that there's certain people that are just born better than other people. And when one of them married a black American, it somehow upset the apple cart to the point that they said, you know that several million dollars a year salary you give us for showing up at public places? We don't want it anymore. Because it had created such a racist environment that some journalists actually uh, described their child as a monkey. And this is, this is British tabloid newspapers. And so they're able to say, keep your money, we're going to get away from this. This is the kind of racism that just comes, that, that people are prepped for by maintaining some sense of hereditary royalty. I'm just saying... That's just got to go away. We've got to stop obsessing about it and talking about it. But when official segregation ended in the schools and workplaces, it unofficially continued in the neighborhoods. Now, I don't know. I was in fifth grade when schools were integrated. And all through the rest of school and through all of my college experience until I got into graduate school, we still self-segregated. There were tables in the cafeteria where black students sat and white students sat in another one. Sorry, Andrew, there were no Hispanics in Glasgow, Kentucky. But it continued by self-selection. You can make, you can pass laws to end segregation, but you can't get into people's hearts. And it showed up especially in churches. Martin Luther King Jr. famously observed that the most segregated hour in America is 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. That we had the hardest time getting churches to even begin to imagine integrating. You can legislate things like removing barriers to integration in property titles or in school districts and in employment. But where we really want integration to happen is in our hearts. And that is why, for me, bringing a little brown baby into my white family in 1989 was such an affront to our families in Kentucky and Tennessee. We broke the unspoken rule of white segregation in our families. Now, adoption is a bit of a spin of the wheel of fortune. I was at the airport in Memphis, Tennessee when Valerie arrived, and along with several other babies from Korea. They were not all beautiful. And I, I know the families that, that also got children that day. They didn't all turn out to be terribly smart. Some of them have had some pretty serious 
psychological and even legal issues. In many ways, I won the lottery on May the 9th of 1989 when Valerie was put in my arms. However, the horror of racism, while it looks absurd because she's beautiful and smart and she's such a nice person, but that doesn't really get at the point. Had she been unattractive, below average intelligence, if she had struggled with addiction or unemployment or any of the horrible things that in fact her maternal grandmother predicted would absolutely happen, I'm still a little frosted about that. <laughs> that kind of racism is just as wrong. You cannot have a double standard and say that we remove racist uh, inclinations only when you encounter a Halle Berry or a Valerie Ray. It has to be that we are recognizing that skin color has nothing to do with people's value as an individual. The presumption of superiority based on race, skin color, nation of origin, heritage, religion, or culture is just obviously wrong without consideration of their relative beauty or their grade point average. Metzl titles his book, Dying of Whiteness, because people are literally dying trying to desperately hold on to some sense of privilege based on their skin color. The interviews in his book, just like the one we excerpted for our wisdom lesson today, shows how much the resistance to Obamacare and the expansion of Medicaid was rooted in the fear that poor white people had that that blacks and Hispanics and immigrants were going to get health care at public expense. The fellow Trevor that he was interviewing that, that, that we just read talked about his tax dollars. Well, he was not paying any taxes. He was receiving public welfare. But he didn't want, he was willing to go without health care rather than see blacks and Hispanics and immigrants get health care. Many of these people also need ACA, or Affordable Care Act, insurance, or Medicaid, but they choose literally to die from their illnesses, making a personal sacrifice in order to keep blacks and Hispanics from diluting their sense of superiority. Missouri refused to expand Medicaid. And because of that, about 60,000 people are dying every year prematurely and unnecessarily right here in our state due to lack of access to health care. Do you know that 95% of those people are white? Their resistance to expanding Medicaid was in some subtle form of racism but most of the people that died were white. Now this graph is gonna be difficult for you to read from your seats, but this is uh, showing gun deaths in Missouri, which gun deaths were down here when we passed conceal and carry laws. We have been above the national average, that's the bottom line. We've been above the national average for years, but when we passed conceal and carry laws, you see what happened because we went from conceal and carry to open carry to not even having to license conceal and carry. So the show me state is now being called the shoot me state as we have liberalized these laws. The rise in numbers, however, this is not coming from Ferguson events. These are not police shootings. These are not, not uh, interracial crimes. This increase is all from suicides because the more available guns are, the more readily available guns are, the more likely it is that someone will commit suicide. White fear, white racial anxiety makes them buy guns. Both my father and my father-in-law told me, you're getting ahead of me here, Tanner. Uh, <laughs> Tanner's been out for a while. <laughs> um, told me that the reason that they had a gun in every room of the house and in the trunk of every car was in anticipation of being robbed by a black person. The whole motivation, and not very many people will tell you, but I'll bet you in Springfield, Missouri, 99% of the guns purchased are purchased by someone 
who is at heart a racist. They are afraid of black people, but then they've got guns all over their house, and just the, the despair about life, unemployment, illness, poverty, loneliness. Is it too much to say the sense of loss of status as a white person makes them turn that gun on themselves? These are not black people committing suicide. These are white men literally dying of whiteness. Here are the numbers. This bottom line is black females, the least likely person to commit suicide in Missouri is a black woman. All of these up here, these are the white males. Now, we're decent people here, most of us. I know most of you. We have compassion for everyone who commits suicide. But look at how this race and gender thing breaks it out. The least likely person to commit suicide in Missouri is a black woman, and the most likely is a white man. And see how in the last few years, that line has gone way apart. This is not a metaphor. This is not symbolism. This is not speculation. These are hard numbers. As Metzl says, the politics of racial resentment is killing America's heartland, literally. Now, a few months ago, when I was outlining this sermon for our musicians, I made the observation that we have institutionalized racism in the current White House in the person of an advisor, Stephen Miller, this guy. <clears throat> Does he just look like a villain in a bad movie? <laughs> Ooh, okay, Alex, I've got this. <laughs> now, we believe that this guy is the one who produced the racist content for, well, we know, he produced racist content for Breitbart News Service before he became an advisor to Trump. But then, he's the one that was the architect of the Muslim ban. He's the one that has come up with all the harsh border uh, immigration policies, including child separation. All goes back to this guy. Now, next slide. I am way too mature to pull a sight gag on Sunday morning. <laughs> Most days. But doesn't this look like photos from a Kentucky family reunion to you? <laughs> I may have even been at that one. I don't know. But what I, what I said in my notes to our musicians was I wasn't sure that Stephen Miller would still be in the administration when this sermon rolled around in January because after all those emails were released uh, in November and it became obvious that Stephen is a white nationalist, surely he would be removed from office. Tick-tock, President Trump. Tick-tock. How long does it take for you to remove a known racist who is unfit to give guidance in policy in the federal government? Don't answer that. I'm pretty sure Trump wouldn't understand the question. <laughs> the more important thing is for my white peers, how much longer are we going to tolerate this? Why has this become acceptable? How long will we pay a crazy price to defend white privilege? I've spent most of my life now, my adult life, in an interracial family. And what I can tell you existentially about adoption is after the first couple of months, you forget that you became a family by virtue of adoption. And in my case, you forget that you're not the same race until someone else brings it up. In one of those moments of reconciling honesty after my daughter was grown, she actually showed me the fake ID that she had used when she was in college to get into clubs where she had no business being. At the age of 19, my daughter was using a driver's license of a 35-year-old Chinese woman, who I may say did not look a thing like my daughter. And so I asked, this actually worked? And she said, 
the only racist thing she's ever said to me. Dad, you know white people are stupid. <laughs> I, I can say that I don't typically feel stupid, but when I read this book, I realize that white people sure can be stupid. And more than that, they are being stupid. They, I'm acting like I'm not one of them. We are being stupid in a way that is killing us. White people, come on, my people, my tribe, this is killing you. My cousins, I know that you want to insist that voting for a racist doesn't mean that you are a racist. I know you've told me how deeply you want that to be true. So let me ask you, since it has now been perfectly obvious for three months with documentation that Stephen Miller is a white nationalist, a racist, what have you said and done to get him out of office? And if you've done nothing, then doesn't that mean that voting for a racist makes you a racist? I know you don't want it to be true, but it is unavoidably true. So here's the hard news. You're just not that special. And while there may be some really fine aspects about you being who you are, it has nothing to do with skin color. And you're about 100 years late on just giving that crap up. In honor of Dr. King, I'd like for him to have the last word today. We must learn to live as brothers, or we will surely perish as fools. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.